Okay, uh, thanks everyone for uh, attending the Spatial Omics Seminar Series 5. Actually, this is the last talk of the Series 5 and Ame and I are thinking to organize Series 6. Uh, so we will be uh, kind of finalizing the schedule as soon as possible and uh, let you guys know. Okay, today I'm so delighted to have uh, Dr. Doug Shepard uh, uh, to be our speaker today. I think uh, uh, Doug received his undergrad degree in physics uh, from the University of California, Santa Barbara, and uh, his PhD in single molecule physics from Colorado State University. Uh, he did a postdoc fellowship in uh, Los Alamos uh, uh, within the Center for Integrated Nanotechnologies and the Center for Nonlinear Studies. And then, um, so where he built a very cool tools to do uh, uh, sort of the measurement and the modeling of gene expression and the regulation in pathogenic bacteria. And so Doc uh, currently is uh, directing a quantitative imaging and inference laboratory at a Arizona State University. So he actually started this lab at the University of Colorado uh, Medical Campus uh, in Denver. And I think about two years ago, he moved to um, the beautiful Phoenix and a and, and uh, so sort of housed in the Center for Biological Physics and also uh, being a factor um, in the Department of Physics at ASU. And his laboratory uh, currently is working on so how to uh, develop, adapt, and, uh, and use high throughput fluorescence microscopy techniques and uh, some statistic inference tools to build a quantitative understanding of how cells organize into tissues and how uh, you can map out the, the molecular uh, atlas and energy expression to infer cell types throughout the different human tissues, including human lung. I kind of wait just to chat a little bit. Uh, Doug is part of the Chan Zuckerberg uh, Initiative Human Cell Atlas Program. Okay, so without further ado, uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Doug, and uh, 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 the floor is yours. Great, thank you very much uh, for the introduction and the opportunity to present the work that my group has been working on in this area. And I would say that we're new to the spatial atlasing field. As um, Rong mentioned, you know, we're quite interested in understanding gene regulation. And um, part of what you know, went with that with us was trying to, um, I'm gonna just pause the video, I got like a weird network error here, um, is to try and build tools that allow us to image faster in 3D and, and do statistics and things like that. And so this is an example movie um, of single molecule RNA fish rendered in 3D uh, inside of cells. And this is from our new instrument. And this is what I'll be discussing today is some of the things we've been working on to try and get this to scale up to entire pieces of human tissue. So as, I, as Ron mentioned, my interest in this really started in the idea of biological non-determinism where, you know, there's this idea of randomness, but it's also that we're not measuring everything and maybe we have poor models of how things work. And so I really like this figure from this paper by Arjun Raj's lab where you have this idea of regulation where you go from the bottom layer up to the top layer. So you have some input, that input is somehow parsed by a biological network, goes to an output. If it always did the same thing, you would have this left-hand side, which is the one-to-one -one map. Um, let's see, can I get the laser pointer? If you have some diversity generation, you would go from one input to many outputs. And then if you're buffering, maybe you go from many inputs to one type of output. And we've been really interested in, you know, how do we do measurements in such a way that we can understand the structure of these networks? It's easy to fool yourself here though. You could say, well, I did a measurement in some dimensional space. I measured an RNA using RNA fish. I did a sequencing experiment and I saw some variability, but I didn't measure maybe something else that was important. Let's say cell size or spatial location. And what can happen with that is you can then get into a situation where actually the, the variability you see in your output is perfectly explained by another variable. And so in this case, from this example work by, again, Arjun Raj's lab, 
it turns out that the amount of RNA that they found in a, in a cell culture actually scaled with cell volume. So they had this variability in the amount of RNA. In this case, it's a control gene, GAP-TH. But it turned out that this scaling law actually was you know, pretty universal and it even held across cell cycles. So you can see the fit line here and then you can actually see different cell cycles notated in different colors. So, you know, I, as Ron mentioned, I worked on um, Yersinia pestis as a postdoc. And then when we started moving to mammalian systems, one of the questions we had is, you know, what leads to this diversity generation? So this is a movie from a colleague of mine, Tim Stasevich at um, Colorado State University. And what actually he's imaging here is real-time translation. So this is an amazing assay. I suggest you check the paper out, which is at the bottom. And so maybe all of this diversity generation is just due to spatially stochastic chemical reactions, two things running into each other. Or maybe it's population he bet hedging. So this, the networks are set up so that different outcomes are done so that evolutionary some cells survive. So here, this is yeast responding to an osmotic shock. The puncta are individual RNA. And like all RNA fish experiments, the cells have to be fixed. So here, these are time-lapse experiments, right? So you can think about each one of these as a completely independent experiment where you need to image lots and lots of cells to build statistics. Amazingly to us, those statistics turn out to be highly repeatable. So in work with Brian Munsky, who I started working with at Los Alamos and Gregor Neuer, who's at Vanderbilt, we actually showed that if you measure these statistics carefully enough and you think very carefully about how to put the modeling and the data together, you can actually make predictive models of gene regulation where you can actually say, if I change the salt shock concentration, which is what happened in this experiment, you can actually predict the distribution of the RNA. We can't predict what any given cell will do, but we can predict overall what is the population going to do. And we can actually even predict the number of nascent transcripts that are in there. And so you actually have here sort of different models. The red is the experiment and this far right model, which is labeled FSP is the sort of most uh, elegant kind of complex version of how to evaluate the model. And it actually almost exactly fits a dynamical property, which is nascent transcripts, which is related to, you know, and things like elongation rate from again, these static snapshots. So where this comes from is well sampling the system, right? So, so statistically what we've done is we've sampled the system really well. So, and as Ron mentioned, we got involved in this, asked to get involved in the cell atlasing work. And there's a lot of methods to try and probe these cellular identities, right? And so one question we asked ourselves is, you know, how are we gonna correctly build up the space and, and, and how are we gonna sample things correctly? And one request that came to us when we got involved was, you know, maybe we can do this in 3D a little bit better because we had been working in something called light sheet microscopy, which I'll come back to. So I think for this seminar series, I don't need to go too much into, you know, how, how are sort of molecular interrogations of cells done. So I'll, I'll breeze through these slides. And if anyone has questions, feel free, to, you know, we can talk about them afterwards. So a common method is to take your tissue disassociated, do single cell RNA-seq, and then use some cell tech markers to then create a clustering. You then look for other genes that you think are related. And then maybe you can go back to your tissue. You can say, look, I found these 10 genes that were important in my single cell RNA-seq. I'm gonna measure them. If I do that spatially, I can learn something about how they're distributed. So in one slide, I just breezed over a lot of really, really hard work that people put into a lot of these efforts. But the idea here is if I, if I have a good idea of what I'm looking for, you know, maybe I can go in and interrogate something and, and, and learn it even if I don't have a thousand genes, maybe I can learn something from a smaller number. And where this becomes important is if you wanna do this in a spatial manner where you measure RNA, almost all of these methods at the moment that rely on imaging-based assays. So again, I'm not gonna talk about sequencing-based assays such as Visium or this beautiful paper that just came out yesterday about doing um, putting barcodes uh, onto an embryo. Here, I'm gonna talk about imaging-based localization assays. And the idea here is you have RNA, those RNA are then labeled with a fluorophore. That fluorophore may be one of a few colors. You somehow have to then remove that fluorophore, put a new fluorophore on, build up some sort of index, and then decode that into what it is. So things like in situ sequencing, merfish, uh, seek fish, you know, awesome fish, all of these ideas are all built somehow on iterative labeling. And the key here is that iterative point, which means you need to be able to put fluids in and out of your sample. And so this to me is one of the key critical things is how do you build a microscopy method that is high throughput, is 3D, has single molecule sensitivity and allows you to do iterative labeling. And so this is what I'm gonna spend the bulk of my talk talking on. 
is this our approach to how we do this in 3D. Part of our motivation for that is that there's an ever-growing palette of um, expanding acronyms and papers and approaches on how to interrogate intact tissue. So there's things like expansion microscopy with in situ sequencing, there's MRFish, there's spectral and mixing RNA fish, there's this very nice barcode from um, UC Irvine that came out, I'm sorry, uh, preprint that came out from UC Irvine last week using spectral information. There's antibody-based methods such as codex. And if you look at all of these, they're using some mix of microscopy methods, confocal, wide field, spinning disk. The thing is when you start digging a bit further to make up for the, the shortcomings of these methods and there's no free lunch for anything, they, they have to not interrogate the sample the way that myself as a physicist would want to interrogate it. They, they do what's called undersampling most of the time, which is you don't take as many Z planes as you should to correctly construct in 3D, or they don't use the you know, correct objectives, or if they do do confocal microscopy, they're very slow. And so what this comes down to is typically it's, it's a bit slow. This causes some issues with trying to do first principle data analysis, which I'll come back to later, which is we know what a single molecule should look like, a diffraction limit is spot in a microscope. And typically the tissue thicknesses we're talking about here are less than 10 microns, except for the expansion sequencing work. Obviously that's been expanded. And even then they showed much larger pieces of tissue. I don't wanna be unfair to anybody and I'm not criticizing any, anyone. Everyone has to make trade-offs and I will show you the trade-offs that we have to make later on. So I just want you to keep these in mind that it's difficult to take this data in 3D. So let's say we wanted to speed something up. So what I have here is an animation that um, my colleague, Andrew York, who's at Calco, um, has let me use. And so on the right, what I have is how a confocal microscope works. So you have a cover slip, you then have a laser beam bouncing back and forth. It does point sampling and eventually you build up your sample. This is very, very slow, but it's very high quality data. There's an alternative method what known as selective plane illumination or light sheet microscopy, which is here on the left. And the idea here is you have two objectives you shoot your laser beam in one way, and then you take a picture. So now you still are only illuminating a thin part of your sample at once, but you're instead of collecting one point at a time, like you do in confocal, you're collecting a whole field of view. So this is essentially multiplexing the problem very fast. So it gets you benefits of the optical sectioning of confocal microscopy with the camera-based methods of wide field or spinning disk microscopy. So why doesn't everyone do this? You know, why hasn't this taken over as the de facto method? Turns out mounting samples in a light sheet microscope is very difficult because of these two objectives. So here I've just got a, a cartoon from Wikipedia of a zebrafish, you know, where we have wide shield, a wide field microscopy. We bathe the sample in light, which is blue. We then detect fluorescence in green. Confocal microscopy again is this point scanning. In both of these, there can be a boundary between the, the optical world and the, the biology world. You can have a cover slip. And so when you have that cover slip, you separate the sort of wet lab part from the laser physics part. With light sheet microscopy, this boundary is violated. And this has led to a lack of adoption for this for any sort of method where you need to say, iterate the fluidics, which is what we just discussed you have to do for um, iterative labeling. And so, you know, how do we get away from that? So let's think specifically about the tissue gel hybrids that people are commonly imaging for iterative um, RNA labeling. So first off, what is a tissue gel hybrid? Commonly for say MRFish or SeqFish or expansion microscopy, you end up putting a gel inside of the tissue. You then somehow anchor the RNA that's inside the tissue to the gel. And then you do some sort of clearing to get rid of excess protein, which can cause autofluorescence and optical issues. It also allows for better probe penetration. If it's an expansion gel, this gel can swell when it's responded to water. In our case, we, most of the data I'm gonna show you today is a pretty stiff gel that does not swell. This, you can vary this based on the chemistry. And so here we've got our inlet and our outlet port. We have our microscope objective. Here's a little blow up in my, in my attempt at a cartoon. Here's you know, all of the black or RNA that have been late anchored somehow to the gel. And then the blue are readouts for this specific round. So you can see some RNA have a label for this round, some RNA don't have a label. So we wanna image this. So if we do wide field microscopy, just to remind you, we bathe the sample in light so the laser beam comes up. We then point the camera at a detection plane, but we have, we've illuminated all of the labels and we have out of focus blur due to all of them. And we're also causing sort of faster photo bleaching because we're illuminating everything. 
If we do confocal microscopy, now we limit where we're shining our laser in. So you can see here, I've just drawn it as some triangles. It's actually a Gaussian. We have a much smaller detection volume, but we have to move that detection volume back and forth. But here you can see we don't have these labels illuminated. And we're also only collecting light from these two labels at once. So there's this optical section and there's rejection. And then just to remind you for selective plane illumination or light sheet, the idea would be you want to confine your laser beam to a plane and you only want to detect for that plane. But you can see as I've drawn here, we have to have a flow cell to do this. So how are we going to possibly put two objectives in there? So there are just as in, um, in as in spatial omics and you know other fields, there's an exp exploding number of acronyms and methods in light sheet microscopy. What it comes down to is they all have good uses and they're all very useful for their specific problem. So for example, SPIM, this classical method is great for developmental biology. Open top or theta light sheet methods are good for very large pancake samples, which is closer to what we want, but this here that's an open, completely open microscope bath. So you would have to use liters of fluid to do fluid exchange, which gets impractical. Lattice light sheet microscopy is a fantastic method for live cell imaging, but again, your sample is bathed inside the objective, so it's very difficult to do label exchange. You also have a limited sample size. There is an alternative to all of these, which is called oblique plane microscopy. This was first proposed by Chris Dunsby, and it has been improved upon by a number of groups, including the Hillman Lab. Um, there's been advances in rendering the, or taking the data very quickly by um, Manish Kumar. There's, um, and then there's contributions that have occurred from other groups such as Bo Wong, and then Andrew York and Brett Fioka in our lab. And so the idea here is you shoot the laser beam at an angle from the one objective, so you can have this separation, but then you somehow have to do something to then try and unwrap the fact that you don't have the second objective anymore. So what it does is it relies on a, a principle known as optical remote focusing. And so here's just kind of a magic trick to, to demonstrate the, some of the principle. So the, the pig is actually not really there, but it looks like the pig is there and it looks like a perfect rendering of the pig. What's going on is it's sitting inside a set of mirrors that actually render a remote optical version of the pig image that you can then look at from any direction. And so the microscope, this oblique plane microscopy, it relies on this idea. And very elegantly, it relies on this paper um, by um, the public in 2007 by Botcher B. Wilson Booth that shows how to do this without introducing what are called optical aberrations. And I'm not gonna go too much into the theory. I just wanna walk you through the history before we jump into how we've applied it. So the idea is if you build sort of two microscopes back to back and satisfy some optical rules, you can actually create a version if the, the pig is up here, you can actually create a version of it here and then you can add a third microscope which re-images that pig from any direction. You could think about now just tilting this third microscope you've added and that would now allow you to then tilt the plane you're looking at which would satisfy a requirement for having one objective that looks at a tilted plane. The problem is physically these two objectives would hit each other. So Chris Dunsby solved this problem by backing off the resolution a little bit and then generating what's called the oblique plane microscope. And so the idea here is now you have a light sheet microscope that only has one objective interfacing the sample. So it has all the desirable properties of standard microscopy with the exception that it is a bit lower resolution because you have to use a lower resolution third microscope. So Ben Yang, uh, introduced this very elegant idea that you can compress the light here by introducing a change in the refractive index. And this is done by putting water there. This allows you to capture more light. And so I'm gonna discuss this more in the next slide, but what this allowed um, Ben to do is recover the resolution of the original microscope. So now you can actually approach single molecule resolution. And again, I know Bo Wong has talked in this series before and, and this mic the microscope I'm discussing is one that he showed data from um, in his talk. I also want to point out these two very nice sort of application papers, which again are called SOPI and SCAPE 2.0. And these are very, very high speed imaging that introduce some ideas about how to generate a very fast volume image. Today we're talking about big samples, so I'm not going to dive into those as much. So what does this look like? So you have a primary objective. It shoots a laser beam at an angle. Fluorescence is collected. You then have all those optics I discussed. It then remakes your fluorescence here, this dashed line corresponds to the same angle as the blue line. That light is then captured by this special tertiary objective that 
was invented at Calico Labs by Andrew and Alfred. That objective then collects as much light as possible. It's nicknamed Snouty because it's got this cut on it. And you then make an image. So a lot of work went into verifying that this could work. And I would say, you know, the person who pushed this the farthest in terms of resolution and really understanding it uh, is Breda Fioca at UT Southwestern. And so in a, we worked with, uh, sort of came into the project later than, than they had already started. And so here are just some examples of um, what a very, very small object looks like under the high numerical aperture oblique plane microscope using this special objective, a spinning disk microscope, and a lattice light sheet microscope. So each of these is a sub diffraction limit, say, you know, a 50 nanometer little fluorescent bead. This is the XY view and this is the Z view. So you can see that all of them are capable of seeing what we call a, you know, a diffraction limited object. And the opium is capable of doing this, let's say, sort of over some distance above the cover slip. And that varies based on how you configure the instrument. So if you didn't follow some of the optical physics here, I think the important thing to just note is that this is a way to make an extremely high resolution light sheet microscope that only has one objective interfacing the sample. And it rivals existing methods that people use, such as spinning disk, and, you know, which is a very commonly used method for, for spatial omics. So this is an actual picture of the current setup. So we have a bunch of lasers that we can bind back here. We have the ability to use it as a normal microscope, which is this arm. Here's that tilted part. And then you can see here's just the, what looks to be a normal microscope. Here's the iterative fluid, fluidics controller. So if we zoom in, we can just mount the flow cell that most people use, which is this bioptics flow cell. Here's the inlet and the outlet. And here's a zoom in of what that special tertiary objective looks like configured. So the actual, what this objective is seeing is then made refocused optically by this silver objective into this little space. And then it's re-imaged with snouty, which is here. So this sounds awesome, right? Again, there's no free lunch. There's straight offs for everything. I hope you can appreciate there's a lot of glass on this table and there's a lot of mirrors. So actually oblique plane microscopy has a lower uh, detection efficiency than your standard microscope, such as a wide field or a confocal. And so when we first started trying to do RNA fish, what we discovered is the spots were extremely dim and we had a really hard time seeing them. And we knew we wanted to do single molecule based fish. So we knew we didn't want to amplify our spots too much using methods like in situ sequencing where you build a rolling circle amplification product. So we looked in the literature and actually there's this very nice paper um, published by um, Xiao Wei Zhang's group and Jeff Moffat's an author on it about using branch DNA to provide a bounded amplification. There also is um, work done on a method known as Sabre, which is very similar, but the, the way you construct this amplification product is a little bit different. And so we, we worked out kind of how to do this and here's what the probe structure looks like. Here's your RNA. Here's one individual encoding probe. Render in single molecule fish, you have a number of these encoding probes. If you were to have an unamplified readout as in standard sort of you know, iterative fish methods, you'd have one dye molecule on this flap. Instead, we use some branch DNA constructs where we get a 25 times more binding sites on this side. And what that leads to is about a 10 times brighter. So it's not a 25 times brighter, it's about 10 times brighter. But it turns out this is enough for us to have reliable detection in the oblique plane microscope. So again, no method is perfect. For this advantage of the optical sectioning 3D imaging, we lose photon efficiency and we have to then have a more complicated biochemistry. And this is really work done in my lab, really figuring out how to do this in human tissue by two um, very talented lab members, Roy Kutoff and Lei Zhao. So what does the data look like that comes out of this thing? So it's actually tilted relative to the cover slip. So you can imagine you're taking these oblique planes and then the samples translate it and you just keep taking images. So here's a movie of what that looks like. So it's confusing because what you're actually looking at is a tilted image inside the sample. So you can see there's some autofluorescence in here, there's some small spots, but this isn't in a coordinate system that our brain is used to working in. It's in this tilted coordinate system. So what people typically do is they find a way to take that tilted data and de-skew it back to what's called the cover slip coordinates. But that's a fairly computationally expensive process. And so what we did in Peter Brown, who's a postdoc in the lab worked out, so it's actually possible to do single molecule localization in that raw data that I just showed you and actually do it on the graphics card. So he's actually able to process, let's say a millimeter of RNA fish tissue with millions of spots potentially in sort of about 15 minutes. 
And so this makes this all go round. And so the other thing about this is it's actually based on the physics of the point spread function. So we're no longer, say, just purely thresholding looking for blobs. We're actually fitting based on our knowledge of what a, a small emitter should look like in the microscope. So let's get to some applications now that I've introduced the, the method and the physics. So you can think about the, the, the oblique plane microscope as a high speed 3D slide scanner. So how does it work? We load a piece of tissue, it then scans a strip. It does that strip in each color. It does it at about 400 nanometer sampling. It then moves over, does another strip, moves over, does another strip. Once it's finished the tissue, you change the labels, you do it again. So here's one of our very first images. And even though this is a completely mangled brain slice, I like to show it because we actually took this data right as the pandemic was sort of starting to shut the labs down. And this was the only piece of tissue we had in the lab. And so this is just a DAPI stain. This is just a, you know, a slice and it shows an X, Y, and Z. We actually have very nice resolution of individual nuclei. We then started working uh, with a Tata lab at Duke about trying to do this on human lung samples that they had stained for surfactant protein C, ACE2 RNA, and all the other markers that are involved in SARS-CoV-2. And so this is one of the pieces of data that we have that we took out of that where we're actually able to image this large piece of human lung. We can then zoom in here and actually look at the labeling for different labels. And so what we have here is a mixture of immunofluorescence and an RNA labeling method known as PLISH, which is a mix between single molecule fish and rolling circle amplification. And so here you can see we actually go in, we can see individual units in the lung, we can actually see the cytosolic protein in 3D. So this really encouraged us, you know, that even though we were kind of limping along a little bit, just trying to get this working, you know, cause we were having uh, like everyone else, you know, out of the lab quite a lot it seemed like it, the method was feasible for doing this fast. So then the Tata lab had taken some samples and they had done a bunch of confocal microscopy for a human cell atlas paper that, that came out. And they had counted various genes that are involved in SARS-CoV-2. And so here are their confocal images. So they sent us the tissue, uh, a slice of the tissue, and we re-imaged it. And what we were able to do is actually now do this. And what I'm going to do is just pull this little section out and actually show you in 3D that we have RNA puncta. We can actually tell that these cells are the cells that we're interested in. And we can tell where, where the RNA are. And can we, we can actually go in and now in sort of a centimeter here of tissue almost quantify the number of um, cells that were positive for ACE2 RNA, the number of cells that were, you know, dually positive for ACE2 and TMPRS2, and the number of cells that were triple positive for a marker of um, alveolar epithelial type two cells. And so this is all published in, the, in various places between this um, human cell atlas paper and then the eLife that contains most of the manuscript, um, most of the instrument verification. So these are one shot multiplexing experiments. They're not the iterative experiment that I described to you that our motivation was. And so once we got back into the lab, we started working on the iterative side and one of the first things we looked at was just a piece of um, mouse olfactory epithelium from our collaborators at CU Anschutz, where I used to be. So Diego Stepro and Leticia Merrill made these. And so here, what we did is we just did one label, but we did this um, using a method known as HCR th uh, version 3.0, which is a commercially available probe. And we just wanted to make sure that you know, this could work. And so I'm not gonna go too much into the biology of this sample. Here's a 3D stack through this area here. Here you can see the 3D rendering of the individual RNA inside one of the cells. The data is now published, and, and here's a link to the bioarchive, but the data is now published, um, and it's, it's out through peer review. And so then what we did is we said, great, let's figure it out. So we know we can put the probes in. We know we can do the 3D imaging. Let's do the full iterative experiment. So this took quite a while because it turns out the human lung tissue is highly autofluorescent. Um, and it's a bit difficult to digest and embed in a gel correctly. And so what I'm showing you here is a piece of human lung. And what's the label here is actually an anchor, uh, a probe to our anchor where we anchor all polyadenylated RNA to the gel that we've embedded the tissue in. We do a digestion with three enzymes. So we do proteinase K, collagenase, and elastase. We then refix the gel. So we re-embed the gel. We then wash it like crazy. And even then you can see all of these strong puncta that actually are present in every channel. So these things, these dots down here are not specific labeling due to this poly A anchor probe, which has a blue dye on it, Alexa 488. This is a 60 micron thick piece of tissue in Z. 
I'm just showing you one Z slice here. So we still have a lot of autofluorescence. And so the question is, can we do RNA fish in this type of sample? Is our amplification good enough? Is our sample processing good enough? So what I'm gonna do is just zoom in on this section over here, because it's very difficult to render this data as max projections because it is in 3D. And so here are all of the found RNA over, in this case, um, 14 species. Um, and we're still playing with, you know, what are the best settings to get rid of the autofluorescence? But what you know was pretty nice about this is because this runs on the graphics card, you know, we can run this sort of spot finding and localization for all of the rounds in about an hour and a half, roughly. And again, just to give you an idea of the scale bar here, this is 200 microns. And so, you know, despite these large autofluorescent features, which are these bright white ones here, what we can actually do for the most part is find our RNA. And so we can actually go in and find those diffraction limited spots. And again, the reason we can do this is we know what we're looking for. We know what the spot looks like in the sort of physics framework of how the microscope is making an image. And so we can actually write statistical algorithms that ask us how likely is it that it's a real spot or not. So if I zoom in here, you, you know, we can separate those spots a little bit more. We can look at those same genes and, you know, we can actually start to see some clustering of different genes. Some genes are expressed all over the place, some aren't. I would say that we haven't had a lot of time to go through and try and attempt to do cell type calling here. So I'm going to defer those questions for the moment and, and get back to you. Our, that's kind of priority number one at the moment, right, is to start segmenting these into cells and looking at them. And then what I just want to show you is a 3D rendering of that data. So all of the very, I've inverted the lookup table here. And this is that same, this is the same bit. And so the dimension here across is 200 microns. The scale bar looks like it's not rendering correctly. So all of these very dark bits are autofluorescent chunks that are going to look very strange. And then this is just that poly A marker, right? So it's the whole tissue. What's going to happen is now it's going to switch to all of the individual puncta. And here I'm just showing you sort of a 30 micron cut. And as we zoom in, you can actually see that we actually have 3D resolution of spots that are near, and I'm going to pause it here, near or on top of each other in multiple Z planes. But we can do this with extremely high confidence, again, remember, because we're taking these optical sections and we're only turning on dyes in a very thin section in Z. We're then localizing these using a physics-based approach. And then that gives us the confidence to call them real spots or not real spots. And so for us, this is the real key advantage of this type of method. And I would say this is a huge joint effort between the lab members to get the sample prep right, to get the chemistry right, to get the amplification, and then to write this localization package that the microscope you know, can then produce data for. So we're really excited about this because this can be used for any labeling method. This, you know, we're particularly focused on single molecule based approaches because this is our background. We're a single molecule lab, but there's no reason you can't do this for in situ sequencing. There's no reason you can't do this for multiplex antibody, which was the very first movie that I paused. That was a four color antibody measurement just done in one shot because we actually have you know, lasers all the way out to the IR for this instrument. The other thing it gives us confidence in is now that we have an extremely, you know, well sort of specified microscope and way to find it, we can start asking questions about what do we do with this really high quality data. And so in that sense, we turn to some collaborators that we have here that we work very closely with it at Arizona State. And so this is Steve Presse's group who works on Bayesian inference of data and Sina Jazani, who is a postdoc in his um, group that's actually done really nice work with this. And what they thought about was Okay, you guys can make excellent data. Is there a way that we can rethink the error checking that goes on at things like MRFISH or other, or other approaches now that we maybe have a little bit more accurate information about where the spot is? And so just to remind you of the way that MRFISH or you know, a, a code book works is instead of the experiment I showed you where every color and every round is one species of an RNA, so one target, P63 is one of the ones I showed you, Instead, you barcode, which means for RNA number one, I would have to see it in rounds one, two, three, and four of my labeling to call it real. RNA two, I would require I see it in rounds one, two, five, and six. So you can see there's a difference in these between these two rounds. And so this allows there to be some error checking. The thing about this is, you know, if you had perfect knowledge of everything, you could actually scale the number of RNA species that you can image much, much faster than MRFISH scales. The problem is the errors just start to accumulate like crazy. And so this is why MRFISH is such an elegant, beautiful method is because it's got a very nice way to do this error checking to make sure that you're not running into problems. 
And in fact, there's intelligent ways to do the decoding there that you don't run into issues. But really, Cena and Steve were interested, is there a fundamentally different way to approach this? So if we think about what happens in Murfish, we have lots and lots of images. Each of the, all of those images have these dim spots that are represented by one of these rounds. You then decode those into, let's say, one of your codebooks here. And you scale pretty well, right? I mean, you're still getting 10 to the third species. But if we didn't have to take this hit for barcoding such sparse barcodes, we could scale much faster. So the method that Sina and Steve have been prototyping and simulating, and actually we've taken some data for them now, is called Bayesian inference fish. And this can scale extremely rapidly along with it. And so how does that work? So, you know, th this is their sort of tail end of the talk, and I'm not going to go into their math. But what I am going to say is they improve the localization and discrimination of multiply labeled RNA. So here we have a pretty noisy image that has the ASU logo. This is a simulation. And each of these is a multiply labeled um, emitter that's extremely, but it's, there's a lot of noise in the system. So by allowing all of the pixels to inform what's going on in all the other pixels, so essentially by both simultaneously taking the noise model and the localization physics into account, it's possible to actually do localizations in extremely noisy environments with very little signal or to learn other things about what's going on. So one, their localization code is extremely robust to background, which is important for us because we still have all this autofluorescence like I showed you. And then two, what they're able to do is do simultaneous localization and classification. And so here's a series of images that we took for them of a cell. So these are just four rounds. And in these four rounds, here's the code book we used for them. And then what we also did in this experiment is that we, we then imaged another 10 rounds and we actually imaged each RNA one by one to give them the ground truth position without barcoding. And then this is their ability to recover those um, RNA. And so I've just sort of shown you this here, this is their scatter plot. And, the only, and what it comes down to is they're actually able to recover with extremely high accuracy all of these 10 species, even though they have a, a code book that's sort of breaking the rules of what we thought you know, we should be doing for correct error checking. And again, I want to emphasize, they went back and checked this against ground truth data, where we singly labeled RNA round by round for the 10 more rounds. So four rounds of barcoding to yield 10, and then check those with 10. So where we're in the process of with working in collaboration with Steve and Cena at the moment is scaling this up, right? As you scale it up, it becomes difficult to find ground truth. And so that's why we started with this much smaller experiment. But the initial results are incredibly encouraging for dealing with single molecule localization in these noisy environments. So what I want to lead you with, leave you with is this idea that, you know, if you improve fundamentally how you're doing your measurements, this allows you to sample better. And what I want to argue is that the way that we're starting to sample these samples is appropriate for thin samples. And it's appropriate if we only need sparse sampling. But if we move to methods that allow us to do, you know, the correct spatial sampling of these samples in 3D, right? And sampling here means how your pixel sizes, the resolution in your microscope, how often are you taking pictures? If we move to that type of approach, what that allows us to do is then rapidly recover where each of these individual dyes is with very high accuracy in 3D. We can do that in a flow cell with optical suctioning. We can then leverage advanced, you know, sort of up and coming mathematics to then try and decode these. And what we can get is really, really high quality data coming out of whatever method people are interested in using. Again, we've, I've focused on iterative fish here. There's no reason that this can't be applied to expansion sequencing, right? It's the same idea. And so I think with that, I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. And I just wanna thank the people that have done the work. So uh, unfortunately, Lei Zhao has actually recently had to leave us due to some changes in visa policy. And so she's actually on her way back to China right now. She's an incredibly talented postdoc who, you know, I'm really sad that this occurred with. But what I would say is that, you know, she, she managed to get all of this labeling working in conjunction with Roy in our lab. Peter and Frankie really, you know, worked out the microscope details. And as I showed you, all of the theory work was done by our collaborators, Steve and Sina, on those last few slides I showed you. And I really want to give a pitch for open science. And really, this comes from my friend Andrew. This work was in very accelerated by the fact that Andrew and Reto were willing to welcome us with open arms to start thinking about this problem, and we had a different use case with them. So there's a group of people we worked with on the oblique plane microscope. There's a group of people we worked with for samples and sample prep. 
and actually for doing the iterative fish and the fluidics, um, Jeff and Brianna were instrumental for getting us up, going up in that. This work was funded by various sources, which, you know, um, Rong already mentioned, a lot of this is done under the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, the Human Cell Atlas. But again, please, this, this open science idea, all of our code is open. We will share protocols. We will do whatever you ask us when you send us an email. This has accelerated this project so much faster than we could have imagined it going. So I just really want to give a strong pitch for working openly at the end of this. And I'm happy to, to discuss any questions that people might have. Thank you, Doc. Uh, this is a very impressive technology. Uh, so I think uh, uh, if anyone has a question you want to ask, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, you can also put it in the chat box, but we try to keep this <laughs> more interactive, more engaging. Uh, you can just uh, go ahead and yeah, unmute. So I had, maybe I can start. So I'm going to here. So great talk. So question that I have is concerning the lung data that you showed and you mentioned about the problems with autofluorescence, et cetera. And you use like three enzymes, but I'm still not 100% clear how you managed to get rid of it. So could you please elaborate on that? We don't totally get rid of it. Okay. But it's still there. So let, let me go back to the raw data that I showed you. So this is using a 561 laser for the cleared and embed gel embedded tissue. There's still autofluorescence. Right, and that does not really hamper your, let's say, signal detection. I mean, true signal detection. I mean, how do you separate that out? So it is a, yeah, so autofluorescence is present in all rounds, right? So this cannot be a true localization if it's present across all rounds. This is part of the reason we need the amplification is to get over the base level background. And then the other thing is, it's very rare but possible that autofluorescence has the exact same shape that a diffraction limited emitter should have. This can occur. If that does occur, it needs to be present and it's present across all 16 rounds of, yep. of our, then, then we call it not a spot. Does this mean there might be some error introduced? Absolutely. But this is how we're dealing with it at the moment. Um, we have tried, bleaching the sample we have with both light and hydrogen peroxide. We have tried more aggressively clearing and embedding. My lab does a ton of light sheet microscopy. None of this works. The only thing that has worked is expansion. And so I have slides for expansion. Yeah. I have expansion slides that I did not show here. This works. The problem with expansion is the gel gets extremely floppy. And then mounting the gel into our system, it's, it's like a hit or miss thing for us of like making sure that we don't ruin the flow cell because the area inside this bioptics flow cell is not very thick. And so it's very easy to either crack the cover slip or break the gasket if you use a much thicker gel. And so we need to go back and re-engineer a different way to mount expansion gels if we're going to do this. So expansion is the only thing that has gotten it better for us. Um, and we've spent a ton of time. It's a really hard problem. If someone solves this, they are, it's a great thing for the community. <laughs> so, Certainly, yeah. Thanks. Hello, uh, I have a question. Sure. Hello. Sure. Um, yeah, so I just, uh, uh, I, I'm great talk. I'm really excited about, uh, especially what you just, what you just mentioned, the shape of diffraction limited spots and, and being able to use that to identify true spots versus um, your, your, your noise. And I guess is, um, is the math for all of that available? And is that gonna work in, for example, other like a confocal system? Yes, so the math for all that is, is extremely well worked out. Um, and there are available packages in Python and Java and everything to fit point spread functions. Um, so all of that math is worked out for a given microscope. The caveat is typically people, when they run these experiments, because a normal microscope is a bit slower. So one thing I didn't talk about is our volume rates here can be significantly higher than a standard microscope. I say can be because it depends on how bright the labels are, right? So we, if we have to integrate our camera longer, the speed advantage we have goes away. But if we have fast frame rates, our volume rates here are an order of magnitude faster for proper spatial sampling. And that's the key. You have to properly spatially sample your data. So in a confocal microscope, that means that you're taking very, very, very small steps in ball X, Y, and Z, which means if you want to image a bunch of tissue, it's going to take you days. Sure. And so the math has worked out, but the math is only valid when you have enough data to apply the math. And so I this see. is the caveat for that. Yeah. 
Thank you. Great talk. So I think all the tissue samples you analyzed, uh, you, you did a, a clearance first and a, okay. Uh, but I think so I this is not, the brain here is clear, but the lung is not clear in this case, but it's a much thinner sample. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I hope someone can figure out what actually happened to those kind of autofluorescent spots. Uh, must be some interesting chemistry there. So some chemical or some molecules, I think it's just out of uh, so much. Um, yeah, and in our case in the lung, clearly where we have lots of keratin or other issues, this also scatters the laser and it's very difficult to digest. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there are some available chemicals. The problem is like the, this true Sudan black, it turns out is actually fluoresces in the red like the far red. Mm -hmm. And so it quenches it great for GFP. And then you try and do an iterative experiment with multiple lasers. And all of a sudden you discover you've made your sample shine in the red. Mm -hmm. And so I, yeah, I think someone will find a way eventually, you know, a good chemist, which, you know, we are not. So. Yeah. Also with your oblique microscope. Uh, so you're, you're no longer limited by the tiny, teeny space to mount your sample, right? Correct. Uh, so in that case, you can sort of address that problem. So, um, yeah, so our stage can move centimeters in laterally. The, the ultimate Z distance is limited by the, so if the sample is not clear, eventually aberrations will catch up with you. There's nothing you can do. Um, the working distance of the silicon oil objective we use is 300 microns. We've not managed to push it all the way to the limit yet. The farthest we've made it is a, about 150 in an expanded sample. Um, and then in a normal stiff gel cleared sample, the sample, the data I showed today is from 60. So we take it in two 30 micron sweeps to ensure we don't, um, for a technical reason. Um, mm. We could do the whole 60 at once, but it would require a, a slightly different approach to the experiment. So, okay. So that's expansion sample. No, that was the, the, the data was. I showed was not expansion. I have some expansion so, data that we made at 150. Um, so the, oops, let's see. Okay. So this data is, this is 60. Mm -hmm. um, and then the... So here's some data I did not show. This is like a hundred and you can see it's gotten all, <laughs> you know, it expands and then it doesn't really, it's very difficult to tell the shape anymore. Mm. Um, yeah, but this is a hundred, so. Okay. Yeah, 100 is pretty impressive. So I think with the very thick uh, tissue sections, uh, do you kind of experience the, some challenge for uh, kind of reagent exchange during different uh, rounds or uh, is there any kind of difference in a problem? So I think the, the thing we have the hardest problem with is getting the encoding probes in, in the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is the, um, for us, that seems to be, and then assembling these, this branch DNA amplifier, right? Because this is kind of a larger construct. So um, so we flush in the encoding probe on its own first. And again, remember there's thousands of these, right? Because they're targeted to all the different RNA at once in your experiment. Maybe you've got 90 per RNA or something. And then these have readout flaps, just like a standard two layer. But then we actually have to flush in both an amplifier and a secondary amplifier to construct the amplification. Mm -hmm. And we have run a lot of tests on how long we need to do that for various tissue thicknesses or sizes. And this step does seem to cause us some problems at times where we have variable brightness. We think we've worked this out. The readout probes themselves actually do not seem to be problematic, surprisingly, the short 20 nucleotide oligos. Those go in quite quick. Um, and then we just increase the time that we let them sit in there a little bit longer before we wash them back out. We do have to do much longer washes to limit the, the nonspecific binding. So we have noticed a huge, and even this is true even in cells with this amplifier method, a much more aggressive washing 
compared to a standard RNA fish is necessary. And in particular, we often see this perinuclear staining. In fact, you can see it in this movie I showed of these cells. And it's unclear to, so right here, um, and it's unclear to us why this occurs at times right here. Um, and so this is something we're actively trying to figure out still where, what's the source of like, what component in our system is attracted to there? These cells are not cleared. When we clear, we tend to not have this issue as much. Um, but, but in just cell culture, we see this quite often and some amplifiers are worse than others. And so we think it's something with the ampli amplifiers. And so we may have to go back and do some new designs and, and try some other ones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. But this, this already quite impressive. I think, uh, uh 60 micron thickness. Yeah. Yeah. We're really happy. And this is literally lay had to leave this week. <laughs> Her visa was unfortunately up and she took the data last week for that 60 micron thick sample. So, I mean, this is like part of the reason we haven't done the cell type calling or any of that is because it's, it's, we've just sort of been getting that version to work in the last few weeks. So we're, I'm extremely excited about it. Mm -hmm. So Doug, maybe one more question. So going back to the autofluorescence thing. So, I mean, the autofluorescence that you would see typically in a lung sample will be different to the autofluorescence that you would see, let's say in a human brain sample, right? Lipofuscin versus collagen and so on. 100% agree. Yes. So, and then, so then how does your, let's say the method or math to ignore those autofluorescence things. So how, how robust is that for those things? So uh, lep effusion is its own unique problem because it can yes. present as diffraction limited spots. Um, and so, you know, I defer to, and I don't know if it, anyone I know. So I know a number of people at Allen Brain Institute working on this, right? And I know they've tried a lot of different things. And I would say, I think they feel similarly frustrated with the current state. The real answer for a lot of people is just is amplify, right? As long as the spots are bright enough, and so I think this is where methods like in situ sequencing are incredibly powerful because all you have to do is sacrifice a little bit of sensitivity, right? You're not, you can't capture low expression and you no longer have diffraction limited spots, but your signal is like a thousand times brighter. And so then you don't need to worry about this as much, right? Because you, you swamp the autofluorescence signal. And so there, I think those methods are, have a, a very key advantage over this sort of physics based diffraction limited spot finding approach. So. Thanks. Yeah, maybe I'm very naive about this. Is there any way you can make a fluorophore much, much brighter? It's not just always like a small molecule fluorophore, right? Uh, I remember 20 years ago, I used to work on nanomaterials. People <laughs> tried to do quantum dots or other. I, uh, there has been some quantum dot papers mm -hmm. um, and they're, they're promising having, I did my PhD in quantum dots <laughs> and having worked a lot on the conjugation chemistry, mm -hmm. um, it's, um, it could be non-trivial to, to get them to do what you want them to do. And then, you know, you need some way of doing spectral decomposition because you're going to excite all of them with a, a lower energy laser. Mm -hmm. Um, I do think that's an encouraging way. I mean, I know Janelia is always working on brighter dyes. The, the thing is, it's not a factor of 10, right? It's a it's photo stability. And so for us, this kind of mild amplification has really gotten us there. Um, and I would, and I think a lot of people are taking this idea of constructing these kind of more nano ball type, not the full rolling circle, but something smaller, you know, that doesn't get too big. But I do know people have done quantum dots. And so I, I wouldn't rule it out as a possibility. Yeah. Yeah. There's a paper in the chat. Yeah, so I just saw. It, yeah, <laughs> so so there, yeah, I, I know I've seen one that was quite nice. Um, and when I was at Los Alamos, they were working a lot on on non-blinking quantum dots and other things. And so I know there's a, a very strong field community working on on making extremely bright labels. I mean, the other way to go is destructive methods like the molecular beam ion beam, molecular ion beam, right? Um, this doesn't have any autofluorescence. It has its own unique requirements. Um, but there you'll never have an autofluorescence problem because you're detecting metal uh, lanthanides. Um, yeah, that, that's totally different story. Totally different. Yeah. And, yeah. and it has its own pluses and minuses. And so I agree with you if the floor fours got brighter it, and I would say the more IR we go, the better. So potentially one solution is 
you know, shifting everything more to the red um, and things get better there. So the orange label in this image here is actually done with a Psi 7 analog. And we've been prototyping the chemistry with that. Our laser is a little bit weak in that channel. And so we're actually quite happy it worked in the cells. And so next up is to try it in the tissue and see if we can shift to red and redder for the two labels. And then this would shift us away because we already see much less autofluorescence for a Alexa 647 Psi 5-like type dye. We see much less there. So if we can do those two instead, then I think we would be in much better shape. So. So I think you you mentioned a little bit, but uh, you're not gonna go into the details, uh, which is cell segmentation. Uh, I think in 3D that might be uh, even more challenging. Uh, yeah, just want to hear your thoughts. <laughs> yeah, I think. I mean, there's been some exciting work recently in this area, right, by multiple groups sort of trying to leverage expression profile information along with spatial information to do the segmentation. So I know there's like a preprint and then Roy Woolman's group had a paper come out on this. Mm -hmm. And I've talked with, with Roy a bit about their method. I think probably the panel design needs to be done in such a way that you're giving yourself an advantage in 3D <laughs> to do this, you know, especially in the lung where we have, let's take, you know, that the alveolar compartment where we have cells that have pretty complicated morphology and they're all squished into like a 10 micron area. I think it's going to be extremely difficult to say that what the spatial arrangement of those cells is without some sort of orthogonal label that marks the membranes. Um, and so in areas where they're very dense, I'm a little bit worried about it. In areas where it's more ordered, I think some of these methods where you kind of know these genes are good markers, maybe my other ones might have some crosstalk and you essentially say it's more likely these genes form a cell. The, the other problem is if you try like a DAPI stain in the lung, it's not super helpful in 3D because it is a complex hierarchical sort of structure. Mm. Um, and at this resolution, it's it can be difficult to tell them apart. So um, you know, I think our first attempt is going to be, you know, modifying the panels such that we include some extra genes per cell to then try and ask, you know, can we segment based on, let's just get 10 cell types, right? And then this, so this is definitely the initial goal we're taking, and this is quite in concert with the Tata Lab at Duke, the sort of what genes are going to give us the most kind of information for the lowest plexity experiment to start. And then let's start adding on to that. And our worry is exactly what you said, that not all genes are informative for segmentation. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, how do we segment in these complex distal airways, I think is something, a very much an open question that I don't have a good answer to at the moment. Um, and so I think these approaches where you use this more Bayesian approach where you have a panel and then you go from there. So I know uh, Aviv's group also had this preprint right on sort of gene programs where they label like all of the genes they think that are associated with one sort of cell lineage with one label. It's sort of, sort of like a principal component in that decomposition of the latent space of the genes. And then you color code that way. That might be another option where you add those labels in. But I agree, this is, I, I mean, if you watch through your series, you've had a lot of imaging people talk. And I think this is the hiccup for everybody is what do you do with the data, right? It's not, everybody's got a different opinion on, on labeling methods and generating, but, but actually generating biological knowledge, I think is a, is a much, is a really key thing that we need to focus in on. Yes. So I think myself, I don't do that much computational, <laughs> but my friends, in a computational biology field told me, okay, don't worry, Ron, just go ahead and generate data, no matter noisy or you cannot understand, don't worry. We're gonna <laughs> kind of crank out and fi figure out how to do. Yeah, I really, I really think those are now ch uh, challenges or problems. There are opportunities for our computational friends. <laughs> I agree, yeah. I really like this idea of prior knowledge of, of genes from the community that sort of mark what you think cells are and then trying to segment with that in mind, right? I think would be very helpful, so. Okay, so any more questions?
Okay, if not, let's uh, thank Naga again and uh, uh, how to, <laughs> we can. I'm yeah, do yeah thank you. <laughs> uh, all right, so this concludes our uh, series five. Uh, as I mentioned, I think uh, we're gonna do series six and uh, quite a few uh, companies already reach out to us. Uh, we're very delighted to have them. I think a spatial genomics and a ACD about taking ACD um, and, a, uh, and a visiting as well. And so uh, we will try to get in the schedule as soon as possible. And uh, please just uh, follow our spatialomic.net and also our Twitter accounts. Thank you and uh, have a good holiday break and a uh, happy the fourth. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye.